We are in one of those moments when history is happening really quickly. In the last few days, we've seen V following significant major changes in how we see the world. One, Russia has moved from being widely seen as a sullen, disruptive and revisionist state to being a clear and present danger to its neighbours. It has directly threatened countries beyond Ukraine, even invoking muttered threats about nuclear weapons. And it has become a pariah state, for the time being at least, to a degree to which it could not have anticipated. Two, the world's major economies, with the exception of China, have combined to cut Russia's financial system off from the wider global system, which is provoking a major crisis in Russia and likely to further provoke additional domestic unrest with knock-on consequences we can only guess at. The EU, the US, the UK, Canada and Japan all impose restrictions on the Russian central bank that effectively prevent it from using its $630 billion in international reserves to mitigate the impact of other Western sanctions. The ruble has lost all of its value and Russia's banks are in something of an impossible position. Video of the first queues of Russians trying to access their money have started to appear. Three, Europe, which only before the weekend was looking like it would fulfil Putin's expectation of a weak and divided response, has become galvanised to a degree that nobody had predicted. I mean, that includes Germany, moving from its formerly pacifist defence light self into suddenly announcing that it's going to boost its defence spending to 2% of GDP, which will leapfrog it into being the biggest EU defence spender. It includes the EU lining up behind including the exclusion of Russia from the SWIFT payment system, which formerly Germany's resistance was preventing. It includes the EU suddenly deciding it's going to provide military support to Ukraine, including providing EU-funded fighter jets way beyond where they were before. And it's been reported that this was likely to be made up of MiG-29 jets, since those are what the Ukrainian forces are trained to use. And they will come from Bulgaria, Poland and Slovakia, which have such jets to give. The EU then funding replacements for those jets to those EU member states. Also, we've seen Finland and Sweden firmly aligning themselves with Ukraine and against Russia, and some suggestion that Putin's invasion may now tip them into NATO membership. And we've also seen just about all European countries closing their airspace to Russian airlines. Right now, Aeroflot planes can fly only south or east. However this plays out, the world has changed forever in the last few days. Now, it may all be too late to prevent Ukraine from falling, although the last few days have not been going tremendously well for Russia's on-the-ground forces. I repeat my caution from last week. In the event of war, good information is often to be found only surrounded by lots of misinformation. Twitter and TikTok have been awash with video purporting to be from this conflict that then turns out to be old footage from somewhere else or ambiguous as to what it's actually showing or even video game footage. We do now have some reliable sources that are checking and geolocating visual material showing strikes being carried out in the aftermath of action. Open source intelligence actors, particularly supported by Bellingcat, are providing a minute-by-minute verified stream. This inevitably has a bias of focus to the Ukrainian defenders because the citizen defenders are more likely to record the debris of their defeated would-be conquerors and share it on social media. The Kremlin's official line to its own citizens via the Russian news media is that what's going on in Ukraine is strategic targeted strikes on military targets only. So their interests are not served by having their military providing such feeds from the ground showing the extent of a real action. And the story that's emerged over the last few days has been some puzzling missteps by the Russian military, where many had been expecting a sort of shock and awe blitzkrieg in the first couple of days to sweep to rapid victory. Instead, the Russians had, at least up to when this video was shot, failed to gain air superiority. 
They'd been targeted effectively by some of the Turkish drones that the Ukrainians have bought, as well as being repulsed or slowed down by the fierceness of the resistance by Ukrainians, who, after all, have little to lose. Always, there is the ominous expectation that this will prove to be a brave, amazing, but ultimately doomed venture. Russia has several more gears that it can militarily step up into, and a range of more powerful weaponry that it can deploy. And as the leaders get more desperate in the face of slow or zero progress, so they will want to push beyond any previous rules or constraints. Intelligence sources reported a very large deployment of Russian ground forces that were making their way towards Kiev, a line containing hundreds of vehicles, including fuel, logistics and armoured cars. That detail being important because one of the factors that has been demonstrably shown via geolocated video evidence is that a number of Russian tanks and vehicles have been running out of fuel due to chaotic logistical support. They had apparently expected rather more rapid progress than they achieved and hadn't planned, therefore, to supply units for the alternative reality of a longer, harder slog. In addition, some evidence emerged that at least some of the Russian forces are relying on civilian radios and mobile phones for their communications. This makes it relatively easy for the other side to eavesdrop on those communications, which, along with the likely sharing of intelligence by US and UK agencies, may be why Ukrainian forces have been so far well informed about where the Russians are operating. Now look, those sorts of mistakes will be quickly adapted for. So although various people were taking heart by Putin's forces' apparent failings, they are probably fooling themselves if they think there is any doubt about the military outcome of all of this. Indeed, the new moves with the US and EU military aid has prompted Russia's top military command to order heavy strategic bomber flights in an effort to prevent that aid from getting to Ukraine or being able to be used if it does get there. So Russia is trying to fully destroy Ukraine's airfields, according to the Ukraine Ministry of Defence. Also today, reports suggested that Belarus was poised to enter the war on Russia's side. Credible video footage of a convoy poised to cross the border. This has led the US to suspend the operations of its embassy in Minsk. Now, of course, taking a country isn't the same as holding a country. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Today, as I shoot this video, Russia and Ukraine are supposed to be negotiating a peace. And indeed, that meeting has just begun. This seems unlikely to be anything other than a delaying tactic, something to take attention while the invasion continues. In the meantime, Putin has made a global hero out of Ukraine's President Zelensky, whose refusal to leave Kiev when President Biden offered to get him airlifted out, and whose defiant, well-delivered video messages have been widely shown in Ukraine and across the world, has made him the stuff of legend. Putin seems not much to care if he goes on to make him a martyr. The Times of London reported today that more than 400 Russian mercenaries from the private militia the Wagner Group have been flown into Ukraine with the mission of taking out key figures, including Zelensky himself. The mercenaries have been told that Putin wants a brief pause to show that he is negotiating with Zelensky, but assured them that no deal would be reached and that the effort would be simply smoke and mirrors, according to a source close to senior members of the Wagner Group. Now, it sounds eminently feasible, likely even, although we are trusting the accuracy of the Times' sources as to the internal messaging. This is Dmitry Utkin, the founder of the Wagner Group. Looks like a nice man. Here he is with Putin back in 2016. The Ukrainians took the report seriously enough to declare over the weekend a curfew in Kiev to sweep the city for Russian saboteurs posing as friendly forces. Now, various commentators pointed out that actions being taken by Putin's forces, which includes camouflaging themselves as Ukrainian forces, using cluster munitions in civilian areas, which was particularly documented in Kharkiv today, 
there were things that were considered against the rules of war, potential war crimes. Yeah, playing by the rules doesn't seem to be a thing we're going to be able to count on in this particular struggle. Right now, the real puzzlement is what is Putin's endgame? And does it make sense outside of a fantasy world? Because yes, sooner or later, probably sooner, Russia can overwhelm Ukraine, use its thugs to remove key people and install its own puppet government. Having witnessed for last week, how many expect the people to accept that government once installed? As we've seen in other countries recently, an ongoing insurrection by people determined to win back their freedom, inspired by the example of their heroic martyrs. None of the existing world powers have demonstrated that is something other than a miserable situation for an occupier. So, what's the point? Russia has made itself into a global pariah and pushed itself into a direct confrontation with current global systems. What's the successful outcome to which Putin could be working through all of that? I don't care whose side you're on. I'm just asking, how does the strategy pay dividends in Putin's best case scenario? Some have suggested that Putin has believed too much of his own rhetoric, that he's become disconnected from his own circle of advisers and slightly disconnected from reality. So Russia has promoted the line that in the same way that they could show the people of the Crimea welcoming Russian liberators, so it would be for the whole of Ukraine. For the Western-friendly government was illegitimate and did not have the support of the Russia-loving majority. Well... Whatever is truth and whatever is lies, that much is demonstrably not true. But it could be that Putin had expected that Ukraine would fold quickly, the population would at least be apathetic and accepting of the change. If that was the case, that was a serious miscalculation. Not because it will take longer to complete the invasion, although the thousands of dead Russian soldiers won't exactly help his standing at home, but because the objective of having Ukraine as a friendly buffer zone country between Russia and the West would then be unrealisable. A simmering, resentful nation, and indeed, let's be clear, hate is a terrible thing, but it's what happens in war, so it's a nation that you've now mostly united in hate for you. That's not quite the buffer zone that Putin had in mind, surely. To actually keep such a country in line, you would have to engage with seriously repressive actions. And that wouldn't work unless you could do it with the most astonishing ruthlessness. And Russians don't actually want to do that here. I mean, you can see this by the absence of enthusiasm amongst some of the armed forces. Countries that repress others with full brutality do it because they are able to see the other side in some way as subhuman. But the Russians largely view the Ukrainians as brothers. Putin himself told his troops that they were liberating the Ukrainians. So again, what's the end game? One analysis on the Foreign Affairs website suggested that Putin, rather than restoring the glory of the Soviet Union, had repeated some of its mistakes. For instance, when it cut off access to West Berlin in 1948, prompting the Anglo-American airlift to defeat the blockade and the creation of NATO the next year. And Stalin's miscalculation that Washington wouldn't dare to intervene in Korea when he supported Kim Il-sung in invading the South, an underestimation of the West's willingness to act that has a direct parallel with the current situation. And let's not forget the final parallel, when Moscow intended to invade and then quickly exit Afghanistan, only to end up mired in a long, horrible war of attrition against a Washington-backed insurgency. The war in Afghanistan played its part in weakening the Soviet Union as it played out its final days. And that's not an irrelevant comparison. Russia, which, yes, has a huge and powerful nuclear arsenal and highly advanced cyber warfare capabilities and all the rest of it, well, it's still an economy slightly smaller than that of Florida, in a state with an emerging superpower, China, and a declining one, America, it is only those two offensive strike capabilities that give Russia any global importance whatsoever. Speaking of China, what is it making of this episode? 
Generally, it's lined up with Russia, gently blaming NATO in the West for events without going too far into disputed territory. And it's called for negotiations and an end to fighting. On the one hand, it'll be very alive to the opportunities here. One to see how a major conflict of this sort unfolds and what it reveals about the strengths and the weaknesses of each of the parties. China announced that it's lifting restrictions on Russian grain imports, a move which you would take as being designed to give some support as those sanctions get applied. China has previously said that it was in negotiations to buy a hundred million tonnes of Russian coal, cementing its place as Russia's largest trading partner. And it got in a preemptive strike on Friday last week, flagging that it would take action if there were what it described as illegal unilateral sanctions. And it said this, We demand that relevant parties in handling the Ukraine issue and relations with Russia shall not harm the legitimate rights and interests of China and other parties. On the other hand, it doesn't mean that Putin can expect limitless blind support. China is being clear-eyed about its self-interest. So, for example, two of China's state-owned commercial banks, Bank of China and Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, restricted on Friday financing for purchases of Russian commodities, apparently to reduce risk exposure to sanctions. Also on Friday, there was a vote at the UN Security Council to condemn the Russian invasion. Russia, as a permanent member of the Security Council, was able to veto it on their own, of course, but it's still worth noting that China, along with India and the United Arab Emirates, abstained rather than joining Russia. China and Russia have a number of things in common, but their approach and their interests are not the same. China broadly benefits from the current world order and expects to grow and become its most dominant player by following the current trends and major disruption to that world economy from global sanctions and to world peace by a conflict that could spin messily out of control. That is something that it doesn't necessarily want to see. Without criticising Russia implicitly, it nevertheless moved a little closer with its statement It is absolutely imperative that all parties exercise necessary restraint in order to prevent the situation in Ukraine from deteriorating or even getting out of control. The safety of ordinary people's lives and properties should be effectively safeguarded, and in particular large-scale humanitarian crises have to be prevented. It said that Ukraine should be a bridge of communication between East and West, not the front line of confrontations. The real question, though, is what's happening behind the scenes in Russia? All those oligarchs who have been happily agreeing with politicians when they slate the West, while then stashing their money there and enjoying their second homes and their luxurious holidays there. The world is not going to be the same for them, that's for sure. Putin seems to be ready to become the bunkered leader in the new North Korea, completely cut off from the rest of the world, save for China. But is that what they want? And all for the sake of Vladimir's dreams of a greater Russia, regardless of how impoverished it may become? Now, there's many an example of Western wishful thinking going on. Speculations about how maybe the oligarchs will depose Putin, a process that Russia has seen before, after all. And it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that something like that could happen. One should always be suspicious, though, of wishful thinking narratives if you can't support them with some degree of corroborating evidence on the ground to suggest it's a process that's actually in train. The fact that Putin humiliated his clearly terrified senior team in a videoed Security Council meeting last week doesn't in itself count as evidence for that, although it is an interesting testament to Putin's state of mind. Nevertheless, if Putin is following an impossible strategy in looking for a deeply hostile state to operate as a friendly buffer zone, sooner or later he will either have to recognise his own mistake or others will see things getting desperate enough that they have to take the risks of action upon themselves. None of that necessarily ends with anything that looks like happy ever after for either the West or for Ukraine. Rather depends on how it plays out. For now, we have to note the current new realities that have surprised us. The early lack of punch in Russia's initial attack, 
No doubt we'll get insights in due course as to why that happened. The swiftly growing unanimity of the Western response is that a signal of a new golden age for NATO or a last gasp? Who knows? The extent of sanctions and the isolation of Russia, the consequences of which are still to play out. And of course, then there's the impressive emergence into global leadership prominence of President Zelensky, who was not highly rated by Western analysts before the crisis. As one of my old bosses used to say, leaders are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they are until they're in hot water. So maybe he will become an inspiration in an age that was kind of losing its way to a host of microaggressions and emotional fragility. Maybe he will be. Maybe he'll become a martyr to the cause. Maybe he'll survive and then he'll get cancelled for saying something wrong. But look, real leaders take real risks. So we never know how it's going to turn out. By the way, I did a recent video deep dive looking at the dynamics of a changing world order, why China is on the ascent and why the West is in decline. If you've reached this far, you might want to watch that one next.